Over two months ago, I released a video analyzing what I consider to be one of the darkest Batman comics of all time. That video did pretty well, and the amount of amazing and encouraging comments I got under that video still blow me away today. Now, why I love getting these incredible messages from you guys, what I like even more is when you guys suggest comics and stories for me to check out. Some of the most common suggestions I got were Batman Night Cries, The Dark Knight Returns, and Batman the Cult. You can expect a lot more Batman comics will be covered in the future. But a comic that kept coming up in the comments was Marvel Ruins. Please, check out the comic Marvel Ruins. It's in the same realm of this. Did this story inspire Marvel Ruins? Does this remind anyone of Marvel Ruins? A video about one of my two favorite weird slash atypical comics, DC Arkham Asylum and Marvel Ruins. Thanks. Now, I am admittedly a DC fanboy. I haven't nearly read as many Marvel comics as I've read DC. I've been drawn to DC's darker tone and grounded stories more than I have been Marvel. I have nothing against Marvel, it just could never hold my attention like DC can. Now movies are a much different story, but comic wise, I've always gone with DC. So not only did I never read Marvel comics, I never even heard of it. After so many people kept bringing it up, I had to check it out myself. Was Ruins as dark and disturbing as everyone says it was? I decided to check the comic out for myself, and yeah, that got dark. Really dark. Like really, really dark. Not only was Ruins dark and disturbing, it was also a fascinating look into tragedy in the human condition. So today, we will be talking about Marvel Ruins. What is Marvel Ruins? Well, to understand that, we first need to understand Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law is an old adage that states, anything that can go wrong, will go wrong. This is actually a shortened version of the original saying. The full adage actually says, anything that can go wrong, will go wrong, and at the worst possible time. What if instead of turning into Spider-Man, the radioactive spider that bit Peter gave him a horrible flesh-eating disease? What if, instead of the angry muscular behemoth, the gamma rays instead turned Bruce Banner into a tumor-riddled bloody mesh of flesh? In ruins, everything that can go wrong will absolutely go wrong and worse, and it will usually happen in the bloodiest way possible. Marvel Ruins was published in two separate issues, Men on Fire and Women in Flight, from August 1995 to September 1995. In 2009, these two issues were collected into a single volume. Ruins was conceived by Warren Ellis as a parody of the Marvel series. Ellis originally called Ruins a black comedy. A black comedy is a story that deals with tragic or disturbing subject matter in a humorous way. This is kind of funny in itself because Ruins is not humorous in the least bit, nor does it present itself as being a comedy. Now to be fair, the word comedy has actually changed meanings through the years. A comedy used to mean a story that started out sad, but ended happy. This also does not apply, so I'm not sure how Ellis could call Ruins a comedy. Ruins is a very dark and gritty story. It's almost hard to believe it was even approved by Marvel. Unlike DC, Marvel is usually more cautious to tell such dark stories. Now, that's not to say there haven't been any darker Marvel comics. There certainly have been. Uh, comics like Marvel Zombies, The Punisher of the End, Old Man Logan, and Dark Ages are just a few examples. I would make the argument, however, that Ruins may very well be the darkest comic Marvel has ever published. The question is how and why did Ruins get published in the first place? Well, as I said earlier, Ruins was a parody of Marvel's. Marvel's was a four-issue limited series written and illustrated by Alex Ross and Kurt Busiek. It ran from January to April of 1994. Marvel's follows Daily Bugle photographer Phil Sheldon as he documents the origins of the Marvel Universe. Marvel's was a huge critical success, sweeping the 1994 Eisner Awards, winning the awards for Best Limited Series, Best Painter for Alex Ross, and Best Publication Design. It was also nominated for the Best Cover Artist and Best Single Issue. Marvel's was a huge hit with the fans as well. It's considered to be one of the most memorable comics of all time. At the time, Marvel's was a lot different than other comics that were out. It looked at some of Marvel's most iconic heroes in a more grounded and human light. Marvel's also had a fair share of darker moments as well. Nothing compared to Ruins, but it had its moments. Ruins was written by Warren Ellis. Warren Ellis is an English comic writer, novelist, and screenwriter. Ellis is well known for his social cultural commentary on transhumanism, which he often influenced to his work. Ellis got a start in 1986 for the British magazine called The Adventurer. Some of Ellis's most notable works include The Authority, Hellblazer, Red, The Thunderbolts, and Moon Knight. 
Ellis has written for a number of TV shows, including Justice League Unlimited and the Castlevania animated series. He was also one of the original writers for the 2008 survival horror game Dead Space, one of my personal favorites. Ellis is a decorated veteran of the comic community. He is a seven-time Eagle Award winner. He also won the Wizard Magazine's Best One-Shot Comic for Planetary and the Sidewise for Alternate History for his work on the Ministry of Space. Now, unfortunately, you can't really talk about Warren Ellis without mentioning the fact that he's a creep and a scumbag with a a long list of victims. I'm not going to mention any specifics. If you want to know the things he's done, you can look them up yourself. I'm only mentioning them in passing because I don't want some big debate down in the comments. I just don't really care for it. But I did feel like it needs to be addressed. The Art of Ruins was done by husband and wife team Therese and Cliff Nielsen. Therese and Cliff Nielsen were both graduates of the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California, and together they illustrated Marvel Ruins. Ruins was arguably both Therese and Cliff's most famous work. The two have actually since divorced. Therese has four children and lives in Tampa City, California with her wife. Cliff still lives in LA. Some of Cliff's other works include The Giver, The Chronicles of Narnia, Star Wars and Star Trek, and the Dark Tower series. Some of Teresa's notable work includes the covers of the Xena comics and some covers for the Dark Horse Star Wars comics. The artwork of Marvel Ruins is incredible. It's actually quite similar to Arkham Asylum, a serious house on serious earth. The art is surreal and otherworldly. It feels like you're stuck in a dream or a nightmare. Some of the visuals in the story will stick with you for a very, very long time. It is haunting. Ruins is one of the most unique stories I've ever read. Admittedly, Marvel Ruins doesn't add anything to the Marvel mythos. There isn't really a concrete story to Ruins, it's more just snippets of all these heroes' twisted fates. Some people feel that Ruins is too over the top and edgy for its own sake. I personally don't agree, but I can understand that viewpoint. Ruins was published only a year after the Marvels, so many readers connected to the Marvels comics for its semi-realistic take on the Marvels' most iconic heroes. Ruins relies on the reader's connections to these characters to shock you. Ruins does partially rely on pure shock value, but it does it well, and it's very memorable. Seeing your favorite characters suffer sick and twisted fates is going to get some reaction out of you. Ruins knows this and pushes you to the very limit. If you like what you've seen so far and want to learn more, then I would like to ask you to stick around. But first, I would like to give a special thanks to today's sponsor. Today's video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. Atlas VPN is the most affordable VPN on the market. Right now, you can grab yourself a subscription to Atlas VPN Premium for just $1.83 per month plus three extra months with a 30-day money-back guarantee. What does Atlas VPN do? Well, for starters, Atlas can stop annoying pop-up ads and it will block malicious links and IP trackers. Atlas will also notify you if someone's trying to steal your data. You can even use Atlas VPN to see if your email has been found in any data breaches. With Atlas VPN, you never have to worry about anyone tracking your activity when you use Google or any other search engine. Privacy and protection are really important to me. And the amazing thing with Atlas is that you can protect all the devices in your home with a single subscription. But let me tell you my favorite thing that Atlas VPN can do. Let's say there's a show or a movie you really wanna watch on Netflix, but it's not available in your region. Well, if you know it's available in another region, let's just say the UK, for example, you can use Atlas VPN to switch your location to whatever it is you want, and that content becomes available to you. Streaming content isn't the only plus side to changing your location. You can also use it to get better deals on platforms like Netflix or Spotify. That's right, Atlas VPN can actually save you money. If you like what you've heard so far, then I'd like to encourage you guys to go check out the links posted in the top of the description box and in the pinned comment. And once again, if you check out Atlas VPN right now, you can pick up a premium subscription for just $1.83 per month, plus three months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee. I really just wanna thank Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Um, as some of you guys might know, I have dealt with copyright issues in the past, which means I can't really make money on the YouTube side for some of my videos, but with sponsors like Atlas, it makes this doable and it just makes my job so much easier. With all of that out of the way, let's get back to the video. Therese Nielsen did the artwork for the cover of issue number one. Both covers were done in the style of the original Marvel's comics, creating the impression that Ruins is meant to be a twisted companion piece. The cover shows Phil interviewing a bunch of heroes as they lie dead in the ground. Ironically, we rarely see the heroes in Ruins actually wearing their costumes. The first panel shows the cover of a newspaper called The Weekly World Inquiry. The top headline reads, Porn Star Enchantress. Does she kill producer with magic? Below that is a picture of Galactus' dead corpse floating through space. The tagline reads, Telescope photos of Mars discovers corpse of supreme being in orbit. 
The assumption is that Galactus starved to death. Even gods aren't safe in this universe. The more you read this comic, it becomes evident that something is seriously wrong here. Ruins is a death world. It seems like the universe itself is actually hostile to its inhabitants. The cost of living in this universe is that you must suffer a terrible fate. The premise of Ruins is that the accidents that created the heroes of the Marvel Universe instead result in horrible mutations and painful deaths. For every kiss, a bullet in the face. For every action, a reaction. For every event, there exists, in potential, a mirror event, an exactly opposite possibility. If the world you know is of marvels, where heroic women walk invisibly through horror and men of fire ride the upper reaches of the air, then only a misstep or stopped heartbeat away is a world of ruins. Saying ruins is the complete opposite of Marvel's wouldn't be exactly accurate. Marvel's had dark moments too. In the fourth issue, The Day She Died, we see Spider-Man fail to save Gwen Stacy from the Green Goblin. In fact, it's one of the more iconic moments from Marvel's. It's probably more accurate to say that Ruins is a perverted version of the Marvel's universe. In the Marvel multiverse, the Earth of Ruins is listed as Earth 9591, California in the summer. The first page shows our story's protagonist, Philip Sheldon, looking up to see the Avengers Quinjet blow up after getting hit by a Patriot missile. On the very first page, we see some of Marvel's most beloved heroes going up in flames. The tone of Ruins is set very quickly. Phil Sheldon was also the main character in the Marvel's comics. Philip Sheldon was a former employee at the Daily Bugle. In Ruins, Phil Sheldon is missing an eye. He was also missing an eye in Marvel's. Phil lost his eye in the first issue of Marvel's, A Time of Marvel's. He gets caught in the crossfire in a fight between the Human Torch and Namor. It's never revealed how he lost his eye in Ruins, so we can just assume he lost it in the same way. For some reason, Phil can't help but theorize that things are not the way they're supposed to be. The world should be filled with marvels, but something's gone wrong. Phil decides he's going to write a book and investigate all of the would-be superheroes in this universe. In this universe, Tony Stark never made it to Vietnam. He was in California trying to meditate and was struck by a piece of shrapnel from a grenade from the National Guard who were trying to quell a riot. He was able to save himself with his vast wealth and extensive knowledge of technology. In the papers, he was known as the Man in the Iron Mask. He joins forces with other heroes like Hank Pym and Doctor Strange. In this universe, instead of the superhero group we know as the Avengers, they are a revolutionary cell plotting to overturn the American government. As a result, the Quinjet is shot down by missiles killing all the Avengers. We see US soldiers holding Captain America's shield and Thor's hammer. Phil says that he can feel his universe was on the cusp of the Age of Marvels, but something went wrong. Phil says that if he can interview the people who have been quote unquote touched by the paranormal, he will discover the clues of who they could have or should have been. We see Phil holding a newspaper talking about Matt Murdock. Instead of becoming Daredevil, Matt died from his injuries. A depressing but realistic take on the Man Without Fear's origins. While at a bar, Phil runs into Wolverine, or Canuck, as he's mockingly referred to here by the bartender. His adamantium skeleton has turned his blood toxic. His skin is starting to decay right off his body. If you're a fan of body horror, then you're going to love this comic. Ruin shows the human body pushed to its absolute limits and beyond. Some of the scenes are reminiscent of a Junji Ito story. Phil asks the bartender for some orange juice so he can take his pills. At this point, we do not know what the pills are for. We see a couple of photographs and learn of some unfortunate fates within the universe. Bobby Seale, Huey P. Newton, and T'Challa Des Wakandas of the Black Panther Party at San Francisco City Jail. Robert Seale and Huey P. Newton were both founding members of the Black Panther Party. Robert Seale was an engineer, activist, and author. Both Bobby and Huey were heavily inspired by the teachings of Malcolm X. Seale was famously against the Vietnam War. He was one of the eight people charged by the U.S. federal government with conspiracy charges related to anti-Vietnam War protests in Chicago, Illinois during the 1968 Democratic National Convention. These individuals were known as the Chicago Eight. Seale's trial was very publicized. During the trial period, he was charged with 16 charges of contempt of court. The judge sentenced Steele to three months in prison on each count for a total of four years. Huey P. Newton was a revolutionary and political activist, and along with Bobby Seale, he was one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party. Under Newton's leadership, the Black Panther Party founded over 60 community support programs for disaffected black youths, including sickle cell anemia tests and food banks. Huey P. Newton was shot and killed on August 22, 1989 by a man named Tyrone Robinson. His motives for killing Newton are contested, as Robinson originally said he killed Newton for self-defense. However, it is speculated he may have killed Newton as a way to advance in the Marxist prison gang, the Black Guerrilla family. T'Challa was arrested with Seal and Newton after becoming a member of the Black Panther Party. This could be a nod to when Marvel changed the character's name to the Black Leopard to try and avoid association with the Black Panther Party. We see Hawkeye being executed by a California military advisor. Iron Man holding someone's head like he's about to rip it off, and we see Wanda, who was a former member of the Avengers, turning herself into the federal government. 
It's implied that she makes a deal with the feds and betrays the Avengers, possibly leading to their deaths. Next, we see Phil in Nevada outside of a Cree reservation. The reservation is in the middle of a nuclear test zone. It's both punishment and reminder to this once proud warrior species. None of the children know why they're here. It's worse for the few children born alive here. The Cree don't teach the children their failures. I think the metaphor for the Cree camps is pretty clear. These images are pretty close parallels to the concentration camps of World War II and the internment camps of Japanese citizens in the US. If you have a sensitivity to seeing those kinds of images, it might be better to skip ahead a little bit, because ruins does not hold back. Phil is here to interview the spokesman for the Cree. He needs a radiation suit just to enter the camp. We get a full look at one of the Cree, Marvell, the first Captain Marvel. It looks like half of the skin on his face is melting right to the bone. We see strings of long gangly hair hanging over the good side of his face, if you can even call it that. I stare shamelessly, getting my first close look up at an alien. An alien riddled with shame and cancer, half blinded by a mutant cataract. Like me, he only has burning questions in one good eye. What happened? How did we come to this? The two sit down and Phil tells Marvell of his plans to write a book. He mentions that he doesn't have a lot of time yet. At this point, we don't know what he means by this. Here, we learn of the Kree's failed invasion of Earth. It was three years ago. It was all going so well. The hull of my ship shrieked like choirs as we kicked into Terran local space. The hyperport locking behind us. We'd swept around your moon, in the process of nailing down preliminary orbit when we saw it. A silvered humanoid, quite dead, slowly twisting above the Earth. It was a thing of space, a sealed biology without need for atmosphere. But it had breathed once. Perhaps it had gone mad. Wanted to know again what it was like to breathe air, but it was sealed. Our conclusion was that, deranged, it had clawed its own chest open to expose its lungs to the atmosphere, and died of shock. Too late, we noticed the creature was giving off energy, some horribly potent cosmic power beyond our experience, and it gated our cloaking arrays. The silvered humanoid Marvel is talking about is, of course, the Silver Surfer. The Silver Surfer was once human before becoming Galactus' slave. As humans, we often take our most basic senses for granted. The loss of sensation drove the Silver Surfer mad, causing him to rip his own lungs open in a vain attempt just to feel what it's like to breathe again. Sense loss sadness is a common trope in stories where a character grieves the loss of one or more of their senses. One of my favorite examples of this trope is Baldur from God of War. Baldur lost the ability to feel anything after his mother, Freya, put a curse on him to keep him immortal. The energy from the Silver Surfer's corpse causes the Kree's nuclear weapons to detonate causing the few survivors to jump into escape pods and fall to Earth. Your mercy, we placed here, the site of your early nuclear experiments. Your species had a sense of humor. We were denied our surviving medicines. If you removed your helmet, Mr. Sheldon, you could smell my bones rotting. One child of eight is born alive. The soldiers refuse to carry out our dead. We have to burn them in piles. We all have cancer. At one point, Marvell felt that humanity had great potential. But after witnessing the cruelty to his people by the hands of humans, his opinion has changed. I can't really say I blame him. We see a news article titled Exclusive Sighting of Reclusive President, written by Ben Urich and photos by Gwen Stacy. Ruins is actually riddled with tiny little Easter eggs if you keep your eyes open for them. These pictures comprise the first seeings of the President of the United States since the unprecedented relocation of the White House lawn, on the day when he should have been meeting to discuss the possible statehood of the newly formed District of New York. The enlarged shots reveals the unusual Secret Serviceman pushing the President's wheelchair. The wings visible upon the man plainly cannot be real, a scratch on the film or a blurred development, but the White House press office remains silent on the matter. In other developments, President X has authorized a new wave of airstrikes in the Genosian police action, increasingly referred to as the Genosian War. In the Ruins universe, Professor Xavier is the President of the United States. We see the X-Man Angel pushing his wheelchair in the newspaper photos. This isn't the same Professor X we often know. This Professor X is cruel to his fellow mutants. A common theme in Ruins is for characters that are often portrayed as being kind and friendly are bitter and angry here. Professor X is known by many to be a sort of Martin Luther King character in the comics, so to see him being betrayed so differently is quite shocking. Next, we see Phil in Washington, D.C. Phil is in D.C. to meet with this universe's Nick Fury. Colonel Fury, good of you to find the time to meet me. Use my name in public again, I'll put a bullet in your head. You're making quite a stir. Been spotted in the two most security sensitive areas in the country. And you write to me. I tell you, if we didn't know you were dying, we'd have locked you up in California. How did you know? Not much gets past the agency. Still don't know why you're wasting your twilight days on this cross country thing. But how about this rain, huh? Now we know what Phil meant when he said he doesn't have much time to write his book. He's dying. I love the panel with Phil and Nick Fury standing together. 
If the text bubbles weren't there, you probably couldn't tell them apart. The lettering in this book was done by Jonathan Babcock. They're both wearing the same thing and have an eye patch over their left eyes. Phil tells him he's writing about his findings and he catches one in the gut for it. Nick Fury punched Phil because he felt he was trying to implement him as one of the Avengers. Remember, the Avengers are being hunted down and executed here. Phil tells him he's not trying to accuse him of anything. He's writing about the quote unquote different ones and Fury knew Captain America. Fury tells him that he hasn't seen Captain America in a long time. You ever get the feeling that it's all gone wrong, Sheldon? Like maybe all this weird sick stuff that happens should really be something wonderful? Like Phil Sheldon, Nick Fury somehow knows things aren't the way they're supposed to be. This world should be filled with heroes and gods, protecting the Earth and all her citizens. Instead, everything has gone wrong. Instead of the clear-minded Colonel Nick Fury in the comics, the world of ruins has turned Fury into a rambling lunatic. Fury sticks a gun in Phil's face, and we learn that Phil intends to call his book Marvels. Ironic, isn't it? Fury fires his gun, and he shoots a rabbit dog behind Phil. Fury admits that as wicked as the world is, he has accepted it. He doesn't have to put an effort to save a world that's already gone to hell. Even if he doesn't understand the purpose, Fury tells Phil that he won't stop him from writing his book. Fury decides to give Phil an exclusive for his book. He drops a bombshell and tells Phil that Captain America introduced him to cannibalism during the war. It's hard to imagine America's favorite mascot would commit such an inhuman act. This is when a young Jean Grey comes up to the two men offering herself for $20. Excuse me, my name's Jean. I'll do it better than anyone for $20. Nice clothes, not cheap. How old are you, Jean? old as you need. Out of everyone, the X-Men tend to get it the worst. Fan favorite X-Men Jean is a teenage prostitute in this universe. Fury takes out his pistol and shoots Jean Grey in broad daylight. Pain. This country is mutilating. And it really reached New York yet. You gotta be a mutant to survive what's coming. X knows, I tell ya. Are you a mutant, Colonel Fury? Sure. Moral mutant. Fury tells Phil he's gonna take a nap. He puts his pistol under his chin and kills himself right in front of Phil. I guess after telling Phil how fucked up the world is, Fury saw no point in living anymore. A bit odd considering the fact that just seconds earlier, he told Phil that him and his colleagues at the agency are eager to read his book. Next, we see Phil in Chicago. He knocks on the door of a boarding house. A woman with a sickly looking baby opens the door. The baby has a fistula on its chest. A fistula is an abnormal connection between two body parts, such as an organ or a blood vessel or any other structure. Fistulas are usually a result of an injury or surgery. Infection or inflammation can also cause a fistula to form. A few places a fistula can form is in the stomach and the surface of the skin, the navel and the gut, and the neck and the throat. The woman says for $20, Phil can hear the fistula say, our lord is dead. Don't forget my baby's name, she screamed as I edged past and upstairs. He'll be the messiah one day. Damon Hellstrom. Don't forget Damon Hellstrom. Damon Hellstrom was a character who first appeared in the early 70s in Ghost Rider number one. He was created by Roy Thompson after seeing the success of the Ghost Rider comics. Stanley proposed a comic starring Satan himself. Roy felt that readers might have some reservations about reading about the devil himself, so they made a comic about the son of Satan. This is Damon. Damon has been a member of a few groups in the Marvel Universe, such as the Defenders and the Midnight Suns. Phil knocks on an apartment door looking for someone named Mr. Jones. At first, Rick Jones pretends to be someone else, but once he learns it's Phil Sheldon, he lets him in. A woman named Marlo Chandler is lying half-naked on Rick's floor. Both are morphine addicts. Rick Jones has been a long-standing character in the Marvel Universe. He's often depicted as the best friend and sidekick of the Hulk. Rick Jones was born in Scarsdale, Arizona. He lost his parents at a young age and grew up in an orphanage. Later, he accepted a dare to drive out to a bomb testing ground in New Mexico. As luck would have it, the gamma bomb designed by Dr. Robert Bruce Banner was being tested. Banner pushed Rick into a protective trench, saving his life, but absorbing the gamma rays that transformed Banner into the Hulk. Rick thus became the sole confidant of the Hulk's true identity. Marlo Chandler first made her comic debut in The Incredible Hulk Volume 2 in 1988. She's the wife of Rick Jones and sometimes the human host of Lady Death. Rick Jones invited Phil over so he could tell him his story. Something happened to Rick in Arizona. He says that the CIA is after him. He wants to tell his story before he's killed. Before telling the story, Rick drinks more morphine. All of his teeth are rotting and his skin looks like it's sagging. Rick starts telling Phil what happened in Arizona. We see a young Rick Jones playing his guitar outside of a nuclear testing site. He sees a manic doctor on a motorcycle desperately driving towards him. This doctor in his white coat and everything was like ripping towards me. This guy was waving and screaming and shouting. All I could hear was test and trench. At first, Rick thought the doctor was going to tell him to leave the private property. That's when he started seeing the water tower spark. The doctor pushes Rick out of the way and the water tower goes up. The doctor is Bruce Banner. The explosion should have killed the doctor, but it didn't kill him. Not really. It hurt to look at him. His skin went black and dry and cracked 
and light shone out of him, like all his meat was on fire. Then he started to swell, and then the tumors broke him open. Instead of turning to the Hulk, Bruce Banner turns to a giant tumor-riddled abomination. Huge pus-filled spores grow all over his body. His bones start to protrude through his skin. His organs start to shoot out from his mouth, and you see his eyeball fall out from his skull. Half of the skin from his face is completely off. His body expands to painful lengths, and it's riddled with cancerous cells and growths. He just turned to this massive cancer, and he's still alive, man. I could see it. They kept him in a vault under Lake Now, codenamed Hulk, man. You asked the CIA. It's possible that Rick also contracted cancer after the incident. He might be using the morphine to help deal with cancer pains. Marlo calls Rick a liar and he starts beating her. Phil doesn't know if Rick's story is true, but he knows that something is very wrong in this universe. Things aren't the way they're supposed to be. Something went wrong in this world, and Phil needs to find out what it was. While walking out of Rick's apartment, Phil falls over the dead body of Frank Castle, the Punisher. Phil is dying. His time is running out. He needs to find the truth before it's too late. I don't want to die. Death is so close, so loaded in my veins and tissues that I can almost taste it. The heaviest snow I've ever known. Death is everywhere. It's falling on us all. Let me find an answer before I go. Let me show them how all this happened. Please, don't let me die in this place. This is the end of issue one. Ruins holds no punches, and it shows some very disturbing and dark imagery in only the first few pages. This is a dark, cold, and angry world. A world that seems to feed off the pain and suffering of its inhabitants. The question is, what caused all this to happen? Was this world always destined for damnation? Or did something happen to set this world into such darkness? This is what Phil wants to learn, and he doesn't have much time. He's dying. Finding the truth may very well be the last thing he will do. Will he succeed? Well, there's only one way to find out, so let's get into the next and final issue of Marvel Ruins. The cover of issue 2 shows Magneto losing control over his powers and having metal objects flying to him. I really love this cover, and this has a bit more relation to the story than the last one. You'll see what I mean in a minute. The second issue begins and we see Phil on an airplane with a woman named Raven Darkholm, Mystique. We can see that Mystique looks very tense. It looks like she's in pain and trying to jump out of her seat. She digs her nails with her own hand. This is when her face starts to melt into a disgusting glob of flesh and blood. She screams out in agony. This version of Mystique has DID that she needs to be medicated for. She forgets to take her medicine and loses control of her powers. She believes she's absorbing everyone's identity around her. This becomes too much for her to handle and she suffers a brain hemorrhage. Men in black come and take her away. We see in the seat next to Phil, it's splattered with blood. Phil is clearly reeling for what he just saw. He has seen so much tragedy in such a short amount of time, it's amazing he's still able to keep it together. Though, given the fact that he's dying, he really doesn't have much of a choice. Phil lands and we see that there's a protest against President X happening. President X is being pushed in a chair by one of the Secret Service men. One of the Secret Service men pushes away an elderly looking man. We see under the man's jacket is a strange looking device. The Secret Service man thinks it's a bomb and moves President X to safety. This man is Magneto and that isn't a bomb. It's a device to nullify his powers. This is clearly a different Magneto than the one we see on the cover. This Magneto is a hippie who, like Mystique, can't control his powers. That seems to be a common theme with the X-Men in the World of Ruins. Phil stands and photographs the man instead of running. Magneto's powers overtake him and all hell breaks loose. Every metal object around Magneto starts flying to him. We see one agent lose his gun and the metal implants in his leg. Phil loses a metal filling in his teeth. The planes on the terminal start to unravel. The Secret Service agent that shoved Magneto has all the iron in his blood sucked out of him. This reminds me of that one scene in X2, if you've seen it. We see giant metal objects and shards of glass flying through the air. We see blood and mayhem. Feels like a conduit in this comic. Everything bad is happening around him. It's almost like this universe is showing him all this on purpose. Somehow, Phil survives and we see him in Texas. He's in a secret mutant prison run by Wilson Fisk. It's Fisk's job to make sure that none of the mutants can use their powers. He does this by mutilating them so they can't use their abilities, like Scott Summers, Cyclops. Fisk burned Scott's eyes right out of their sockets so he couldn't use his powers. He mistreats all of the inmates, beating, cursing, and mutilating all of them. Kitty Pride gets stuck in the wall of her cell and rips out her intestines while trying to escape. Nightcrawler has gone sane and is seen biting on his own tail. Fisk explains that President X often visits the prison. Old President X comes down to visit sometimes. Sometimes she just sits here in a chair and stares at him kind of sad. Other times, Lordy, the things he says is to leave him all sobbing and throwing up. 
One time, I remember he dropped his pants and screamed, You all came from this. It's unclear if President X is literally all the X-Men's father, or if it's just a metaphor. But one thing that is clear is that this isn't the Charles Xavier we're used to seeing. The entire X-Men prison is under his order. Next we see what Fisk has done to Quicksilver. They cut off his legs and arms, leaving him a bloody sack sitting in the corner. Oh no, that's for Quickie's own good, Mr. Sheldon. Don't go feeling sorry for him. Warden Fisk, why are you keeping these paranormals here? Because that's what I've been told to do. Because that's the way it is. The president, you see, he knows. He keeps it this way. That's the way he wants it. All locked up quietly. You heard about this place in rumors, I know. Rumors don't hurt anything, Mr. Sheldon. Now let's go and collect your camera and see you on your way. The president said I should extend you every courtesy after all. He didn't want you to bring no proof out, but he said he wanted to grant a dying man his last request. It seems like everyone knows that Phil is dying. Next, we see Phil writing in his journal by a pond. This is the first time we've seen Phil take a break since the start of the comic. He sits by himself for a while, and then a little girl comes along. This reminds me of the scene in Frankenstein. These people, these paranormal ruins of man, they were dropped on a world like a stone. Their shockweights have touched all edges of my world. Mister, you looked all alone, so I got you flowers because they're alive and can be company. Th thank you. My mother talks to her flowers all the time. We're having a picnic. Would you like to have sandwiches with me and my mommy? This is a really important scene. It's good to have these more somber moments to break up the violence. It can be very taxing to read nonstop sorrow and sadness. It's important to have these slow and somber scenes to give the reader a chance to breathe. It also slows down the pace and gives you a chance to reflect on the very disturbing things you've seen. Dr. Donald Blake, a cult leader who believes he can channel the entity Thor through his body after becoming addicted to flyagric mushrooms. This is a bit odd because we know Thor exists as an Avenger in this universe. We saw a soldier holding up his hammer as a memento. So it's a bit of a continuity error. Emma Frost owns the Church of the Next Generation, where she legally adopts the children of her followers and has them undergo surgery to unlock their quote-unquote psychic abilities. This is the point when the artist for the comics switches hands. Chris Moeller took over for the Nielsens and illustrated the last 17 pages of the second issue. Chris Moeller has a long-standing career illustrating for Dark Horse Comics. He's also attributed some art to both Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. I have to say, I really do like his art style. It's colorful and stylized. Though it's so different from the art style of the rest of the comic that it is a bit jarring. It's odd Marvel didn't even try and hire an artist to replicate the Nielsen's work to at least try to make the artwork similar. I've tried looking up why the artist switched so late in development, but I couldn't really find any solid answers. Next, we see Phil investigating rumors of a paranormal traveling circus. Makeshift circus ring laid out on desert floor. Ugly people do their shtick for thin audience of uglier people. Attractive woman does something illegal with a python for 10, 15 minutes. The woman is Zelda Dubois, who engages in illegal activity with her pet snake. Zelda Dubois, also known as Princess Python, is a snake charmer who uses her giant pet python to help her commit crimes. Zelda first appeared in The Amazing Spider-Man number 22 in March 1965. She also travels with a circus in the comics and is an occasional love interest of Johnny Blaze. Speaking of Ghost Rider, Hush comes over the place as the main attraction slowly rides into the ring. St. John, or Blaze they call him. Lots of scarring on his face. Dead eyes like a flagellant. Blaze they call him. St. John. Getting old. Never saw it coming. Never put it together. The name. The car. The deadness. The thin, evil smell of gasoline and the lighter. St. John never survived. If it wasn't clear yet, this is Johnny Blaze, the Ghost Rider. Instead of a supernatural agent for the demon Mephisto, he's a depressed stuntman who sets his own head on fire. The stunt goes wrong and he rides off into the desert with the flesh burning off his face, right down to his skull. And he screams the whole time. But for hours after this shit, he rode around the desert screaming. Technically dead, facial fat flying off his torched head like hot rain, but still riding, screaming. Next we see Phil in a hotel room reminiscing about the recent events. At the start of the story, Sheldon had a full head of hair. Now, he's balding rapidly. This could simply be due to the switching of artists, or it could be a sign of his failing health. Phil's time is running out. He thought if he went looking for these paranormal people, he would find a singular event that started it all. All the pain, all the suffering, but now he's not too sure. But there is one thing he does know. He needs to write the truth. He feels like he needs to show the world what this universe could have been. Phil goes to get some sleep. He dreams of the Avengers like how we know them. It's almost as if Phil is looking to the other world of Marvels. It's like Phil's connected to his alternative self. 
I wonder if this is why he feels so strongly that things aren't the way they're supposed to be. And I dream of men on fire in the upper reaches of the air, and women in flight dancing in stilettos on clouds. And the good men come and drag President Tricky from his retirement palace and kick him to death. And they show President X Washington and every place else and make him cry until he promises to fix it all. And good things happen every day. And walking in the street becomes like going to church. For there are high fashion angels in the sky and we clap and cheer. And good things happen every day. We see some old war photos. Oklahoma, militia men taken into custody by police following reports of threatening behavior. Brief interview. Unashamed fascist Monroe write, Hitler was a great man with sad failings with cannibal leanings, particularly in Creed, left. Bucky Barnes, center, dispute out sexual obscenities until sedated. Phil's next stop is the Rocky Mountains. He's meeting with Ben Grimm. Human Ben Grimm. Just like in the comics, Ben is a pilot. While in school, Ben met Reed Richards, Sue Storm, and Johnny Storm. Reed Richards asks Ben to be the pilot of the craft so he can study cosmic ray activity. When Ben is reluctant, Reed Richards grows impatient and plans on stealing the ship for his studies. Ben tells him he's not going to do it and that you have a falling out. Ben wanted to install lateral motors on the ship, but that would have delayed it. Reed Richards finds Victor Von Doom to fly the plane. With Doom piloting the craft, the crew flew right into a flash storm. They were all hit with fatal levels of cosmic radiation. Reed Richards becomes an elongated skeleton. Johnny Storm burned from the inside out. Sue Storm becomes invisible. She becomes completely light reflectors, including her eyes, which make her blind. All of Doom's organs are on the outside of his body. You know what the worst of it is? Despite having no laterals, despite the flash storm, I can't help thinking it would've been different if I'd flown her. I can't help it. You can see the regret in Ben's eyes. It's hinted that this may have been the event that caused everything to go wrong. This is contradicted by the fact that Captain America introduced cannibalism to Nick Fury. Is this the start of the butterfly effect, or has this world been screwed from the get-go? The answer isn't clear. I think what is clear, however, is that there's no going back. The world is damned. Phil knows this, and he's not trying to save it. He knows that's not possible, but if he can just find an answer, then maybe it wouldn't all be for nothing. Next we see Phil in New York City. Marvels. A green man. A body that stretched before rigor mortis set in. Silver spaceman, invisible woman. Marvels. That's what I'll call the book. I have all those notes and all the interviews. I can write the book, and please God, I can write it quickly. However, it appears Phil's time might be up. He sees he has painful looking gashes in his hand. He says he's hot and dizzy. On the train back, Phil ran out of pills. He starts cursing Peter Parker. This is the first time we hear Peter's name in the story. Parker. Peter Parker. So hot, I hate New York. Stop for a minute. Parker. I always hated him. Weasley kid. Had to be Parker, didn't it? Lousy photographer. Worked freelance for the Bugle, paying his college tuition and keeping that poisonous old aunt of his. A science major know-it-all weasel. Kid messes up a college experiment, got bitten by a spider, he irritated. Got infected, rattled with a raging mutant virus. Got infectious, visited the bugle offices before his rash showed. Contagious little weasel. Peter infected Phil with his disease. We see a close-up of a wedge-shaped rash on Peter's hand. This is what Phil has been dying from. Instead of spider powers, the radioactive spider that bit Peter gave him a mutating flesh-eating virus. Peter's entire body is infected with horrible disease. He's bleeding from his skin and can't wear clothes. He lost all of his hair. He looks more like a corpse than a human. His eyes are black and white. He's left with only a few puffs of mangly hair. The cracks in his skin resemble a spider web. I believe this is the most haunting image of the story. In a story with no shortage of disturbing images, that's saying a lot. It's a shame we couldn't see how the Nielsens would have illustrated the scene. Phil's ready to publish everything before his medicine runs out and the virus overtakes him. The web starts to spread to Phil's hands and face. He falls back as his briefcase bursts open. All of his notes and pictures come flying out. Phil pleads with God just to let him live a little bit longer so he can publish his work. These prayers are unanswered. People don't even stop to look. Death is so common in this world that it has become acceptable for dead bodies to be left alone in the open street to rot. As he lies on the street dying, all of his notes scattered in the wind, lost forever. This is where the story ends. Marvel Ruins is unlike anything I've ever read before. As I said earlier, Ruins doesn't add much to the Marvel mythos, but it doesn't really need to. Ruins is an experience. We don't always need a complex story to enjoy what we read. The disturbing and dark imagery in this comic will stay with you for a very long time. And Ruins has stayed with fans for a long time. It's still considered by many to be one of, if not the most disturbing Marvel comic of all time. 
its legacy will and will continue to stand the test of time. And funny enough, as I was recording this video, I started seeing a bunch of TikToks about Marvel Ruins show up, which was kind of fortunate for me, I would say. Um, so clearly fans still gravitate towards it. It's just such a unique comic, it's clear to see why. I had a lot of fun analyzing Ruins. I think it's pretty clear to see I love dark comics, and according to my analytics, you guys love when I talk about dark comics as well. So I would love to get more suggestions down in the comments below. What other dark comics would you guys like me to check out? I really want to know. Uh, before I get out of here, I just want to say thank you guys for watching this video. Uh, I say this at the end of every video now, but I am still just so blown away by all the love and support. I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, if you want to find me elsewhere, I'm over on Twitter, so I'd appreciate it if you guys could follow me there. If you really loved what you've seen and you want to support me, I'm now over on Patreon. It is absolutely not mandatory, but it would certainly help me out. Uh, starting with the video that comes out after this, I'm going to start releasing my videos on Patreon a week before I upload them to YouTube. So if you want to get my videos a week early and want to help support me, then please check down below and check out my Patreon. You can follow... You can also find me over on Twitch. Uh, I streamed myself playing Batman Arkham Asylum a while ago, and it was a lot of fun. I'm going to be streaming every week now. Starting on Friday the 23rd of this month, I will be streaming every Friday, Sunday, and Wednesday. I'll be playing the rest of the Arkham series, so City is next. So if that's something you want to see, then come check it out. I'm going to try, emphasis on try, to stream on both Twitch and YouTube, but I can't make any promises. Lastly, I would like to thank Atlas VPN one more time for sponsoring this video. Uh, it's, it's a lot of help. All right. That's all I got to say. Uh, see ya.